Yeah, cool. So not we're just not testing it, we're actually using it. And we have new cameras, one there and one there, and they have all this fancy stuff that you can preset the angles and do all the rest of it. And I've been joking with people, uh, it's actually not completely a joke. That the cameras are so much higher than the ones that we used to have down here that I'm afraid of the reflection that's going to be coming off of me here. But um, it's, it's awesome that we're able to do this and, and to offer that upgrade to our video ministry to the world. Um, I'd also like to note before I forget that we have a very special anniversary that we want to celebrate this week, and that's the McLaughlins, and it's 65. Mary, how did you do it? Congratulations. That's quite the accomplishment. It really is. Tonight at 6 p.m., our High Point Youth Ministry will be meeting here at 6 p.m. Uh, and so be prepared for that. Now, next Sunday, we have our Super Bowl of Caring, and it will be a soup lunch after church. If you want, please bring a crock pot or a, a bowl of soup that you can share 
with the other folks after worship. Monday, tomorrow morning at 9 a.m., we have our, our Bible study at the Grand Traverse Pie Company. Wednesday at 7.30 p.m., we have our Bible study and beer at the Terre Haute Brewing Company. Friday at 10 a.m., we have a staff meeting. So those of you who are staff, and I don't mean infection, I mean staff, uh, please be here for that. A week from Wednesday is Ash Wednesday, believe it or not. I've had several people say to me, I can't, how did that happen? Well, it's, it's coming around the corner. And we will have our cooperative worship service with the Unity Presbyterian Church at their building at 7 p.m. on the 18th, Wednesday, Ash Wednesday. Starting, uh, what is that, two weeks from today, the 18th, we have our first Lenten study series, and we're going to do something a little bit different with it this year. Uh, because attendance has been a little sketchy on Wednesday nights, we're going to try having the Lenten study series during Sunday school. So in the lounge, we'll have our, uh, our first one of those on the 18th, and we're going to be going through a book that you do not have to purchase, but it's there if you want it, and it's, it's uh, Lent in Plain Sight, is that the name of it? I think that's right. Also on the 18th, we'll have a congregational meeting following worship because uh, Steve Mead, our, our nominating chair, noticed a couple of things that need to be cleaned up, corrected, changed, and so that will be on that day. One of them is that we've had a volunteer wanting to join, the, uh, or I should say rejoin the deacons, for which we're very grateful. For our prayers this morning, we'd like to uh, hold in prayer it's Mark, right, Judy? Mark Decker? Her brother, who had a, a big heart attack, but he's doing much better, she tells me now. So praises for that and, and for his continued recovery. That would be well worth praying for. And finally, uh, Tim and Eileen and Asher Gogli. Tim is our youth director. They are on their way to his native land of India. And when they arrived there, he told me, he came in here very early this morning to do a couple of things before he left town. They're leaving today. It will be the day after tomorrow in India when they arrive. So that's a long trip. You probably know a little bit about that. Um, but let's pray for safety for them and, and for that happy reunion. Uh, Tim's family have never met their baby Asher. So this will be the first chance for that to happen. And we thank God for that. And speaking of God, let us now turn our hearts and minds to worshiping our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Please join me in the call to worship. We have come together to worship the God of light and power who is beyond our understanding. Before the brightness of his presence, angels veil their face. With reverence and adoration, let us sing God's praises.
Please join me in the call to confession. If anyone sins, we have someone who pleads with God. Jesus Christ, the righteous one, to himself, it's the means by which sins are forgiven. And our, not our sins only, but also the sins of all who confess them. Let us pray. Holy and merciful God, in your presence, we confess your shortcomings and our offenses against you. You alone, often we have sinned in wandering from your ways, in wasting your gifts, and forgetting your life. Forgive us when what Herod, selfish, makes us willing to hurt others. Forgive us when, unlike the Magi, we refuse to follow you. Mercy on us, O Lord. We are sorry for all we have done to displease you. Forgive our sins and help us to live in your light and walk in your ways for the sake of Jesus. Hear the good news. If we have died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. So you also must consider yourself dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Friends, believe the good news. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Praise God. Since God has forgiven us in Christ, let us forgive one another. The peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. All right, eight, eight stuffies with you. How about that? I didn't bring any today. Um, so I read in, on the internet, so it must be true, that there was a way that I could illustrate something, and it was, I was supposed to have somebody out there in the, in the congregation who has a secret microphone, and while I was talking, they were, all of a sudden they were just supposed to start screaming. And I thought, well, that's a little disturbing, so we're not going to do that. But instead, I thought we could do this. And I wanted to show you guys and see if you want to do this. Yeah, that's pretty loud, isn't it? Now, I play the drums, and I love things like this. I like to make noise with them. When I was your age, I said to my parents, I want to play the drums. And they said, no. It's too noisy. And then I kept saying it, and, and so finally my dad said, well, Mike, if you play something else for a year 
and you still want to play the drums, you can play the drums. So I took up the saxophone, and I found out that I was kind of good at it, and I liked it, but at the end of the year, do you know what I wanted? I wanted to play the drums. So I went to my parents, and I said, I want to play the drums, and they said, no. Then this is why. I like making noise. You want to try it? You don't have to hit it that hard unless you, oh, good, good job. Why did I doubt that you would do that? I have no idea why I thought that would work. Try it, Charlie. Good job, Tess. Can you do it even with all your stuffies there? <laughs> you didn't want to give your mom a chance? Okay, all right. The, the idea is that sometimes we need to wake up. I don't know if you ever feel this way when you're at your age. I don't remember thinking about this very much when I was little, but um, sometimes we get into these patterns that we follow every day, and they're kind of the same. And Mrs. Riggins and I have a wonderful way that we start most of our days where we, we get a cup of coffee, and we sit down in these two chairs, and, and Mrs. Riggins is into lights. She likes Christmas lights all over the house. So we don't have the regular lights on, but we have all the Christmas lights on. So there's like this nice glow and all of that. And we sit there and we talk. And if you had told me when I was, say, 16 and just starting to date Mrs. Riggins that I would enjoy talking every morning like that, I would have said, are you kidding me? But, it, and, but the thing that we do more often than anything else is figure out what our schedule is going to be, what we have to do that day and the day after that and the day after that. It's a wonderful way to wake up. If, if there's a way to wake up without doing this, that's a pretty good way. But sometimes we need to be shaken up a little bit. We need to have something different happen. We need to find a way to, that makes us think about things. And that's really what the Bible is, is a way to kind of do this. But we have to pay attention. Well, first of all, we have to read it. And then we have to pay attention to what we're reading. And then, this might be the hardest part of all, so we have to think about it. And I don't know about you, but there are times when I don't really want to think. <laughs> yeah. I, just, I would just rather do this than think. But that's what God wants from us, is to pay attention, wake up, and sometimes think about it, so that maybe we can change something that we've been doing or that we're thinking or that we want, or whatever. So, let's pray. Dear Lord, thank you for giving us ways to think, for giving us brains, and for giving us your Bible and all of that. Help us, we pray, to use what you've given us to help us wake up and become more like the person you want us to be. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, guys, thank you. Let us pray. Lord God, teach us by your word, we humbly pray, that we might come to a deeper understanding of your ways. Help us to conform our heads and hearts to your desires. Lead us in those paths which you have ordained. Use your church to make peace, lift up truth, and spread love in your world. In your holy name we pray. Amen. The first scripture reading is from Isaiah 40, 21 through 31. Have you not known? Have you not heard? Has it not been told to you from the beginning? Have you not understood the foundations of the earth? It is he who sits above the circle of the earth, and its inhabitants are like grasshoppers, who stretches out the heavens like a curtain, and spreads them like a tent to live in, who brings princes to naught, and makes the rulers of the earth as nothing. Scarcely are they planted, scarcely sown, scarcely has the stem taken root in the earth, 
when he blows upon them, and they wither, and the tempest carries them off like stubble. To whom then will you compare me, or who is my equal, says the Holy One? Lift up your eyes on high and see. Who created these? He who brings out their host and numbers them, calling them by name, because he is great in strength, mighty in power, not one is missing. How do you say, O Jacob, and speak, O Israel? My way is hidden from the Lord, and my right is disregarded by my God. Have you not known? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He does not faint or grow weary. His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the faint and strength strengthens the powerless. Even youths will faint and be weary, and the young will fall exhausted. But those who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. So ends the reading of the scripture. For our New Testament lesson this morning, we turn to the first letter to the Corinthians, chapter 9, beginning in verse 16. 1 Corinthians 9, 16. Listen now for the word of God. 
This is the Apostle Paul writing. If I proclaim the gospel, this gives me no ground for boasting, for an obligation is laid on me, and woe to me if I do not proclaim the gospel. For if I do this of my own will, I will have a reward. But if not of my own will, I'm entrusted with a commission. What then is my reward? Just this, that in my proclamation, I may make the gospel free of charge so as not to make full use of my rights in the gospel. For though I am free with respect to all, I have made myself a slave to all so that I might win more of them. To the Jews, I became as a Jew in order to win Jews. To those under the law, I became as one under the law, though I myself am not under the law, so that I might win those under the law. To those outside the law, I became as one outside the law, though I am not free from God's law, but am under Christ's law, so that I might win those outside the law. To the weak, I became weak, so that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all people, that I might by some means save some. I do it all for the sake of the gospel, so that I may share in its blessings. If that's confusing to you, we'll try to clear that up in a few minutes, okay? That's an that's a inside and out one there. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Kevin Christ said to me earlier today, he was a little worried about this sermon. He, he saw the title and he thought, where's he going with that one? And, uh, well, we're about to find out. As Christians... We have inherited our religious identity from a people the world does not quite know how to handle. I had a Jewish great-grandmother, Frederica. She emigrated from Austria around the turn of the last century. She went to St. Louis, where she met her future husband, my great-grandfather. They got married at the St. Louis County Courthouse, very close to where the arch has been built, about 50 years after they got married there. She died a couple of years before I was born, in 1959. Now, not even my cousin Diane, my eldest cousin who's done all the genealogy, and by the way, that's the best gift you can have, is that somebody in your family does the genealogy for you. Uh, she. Nobody knows for sure whether Frederica stayed a Jew. Did she practice Judaism? Did she join the Roman Catholic Church? Because her, her husband, my great-grandfather, was Roman Catholic, as was my entire maternal line until mom. Did she practice some other form of Christianity? Did she just not go? We don't know. We have no idea. But we do know this much. If she stayed Jewish, if she continued to practice Judaism actively, it probably would have caused problems. Because they, the family had moved out to the suburb of Webster Groves, and it was, a, at that time, a very white, very Protestant, not even Roman Catholics were that common in Webster and if she had tried to remain Jewish, then she would have stuck out. It would have made her possibly uncomfortable, alone, possibly. I don't know. Webster Groves, to my knowledge, has never had a synagogue in it to this day. It's where my maternal family, uh, my maternal line, they were all from Webster by about 1920, ever since then. It's where Chuck and Sandy Culp grew up. Same town. I'm not calling it racist or bigoted. It's just, it was very homogenous, very white, and very Protestant. Whenever and wherever the Jews have gone, they have tended to remain a little bit separate, a little bit unique. Though after a couple of generations, they tend to fit in pretty well culturally. They certainly do very well 
academically and economically on the main. They do not, however, really fully assimilate. And this has created problems for them and problems for others. In my childhood and in my youth, my family moved a lot. And we tended to land in suburbs like Webster Groves. I've never actually lived there myself, but places like that. Places that now have pretty substantial Jewish populations. I attended many of the bar and bat mitzvah as a kid. I carried on a correspondence with my friend Chris Roth, who was Jewish and lives now in Prairie Village, suburb of Kansas City. Max knows it well. We were just talking about how he, uh, in one of his very first games as a head coach, he was defeated by the son of Hank Stram. Hank Stram is Jewish. I don't know if people knew that, but he was the coach of the Kansas City Chiefs, a very successful one at that. His son, Stu, was a very good football player, and I went out with his daughter, Julie, a few times. Although at that point in my life, going out with a girl was like, you know, you went to roller skating or something like that. It wasn't that big a deal. Anyway, I'm just trying to say that I'm making a comment about the Jewish people as they do not tend to assimilate, but I'm not trying to, to criticize them or to put them in any bad light whatsoever. They are just proud. They maintain their identity. I think that's wonderful. It wasn't until my cousin did our genealogy that I really knew what my identity was anyway, but they know. What we're seeing today in the world is in part a result of this very thing. You have the Palestinians who had Hamas conducted the sneak attack on the Jews and the Jews have busied themselves killing the Palestinians ever since. And as I've told a number of you, you've, some of you have asked me, to some of you I've volunteered this opinion of mine, but in my opinion, neither side is right. I think they're both dead wrong. And I mean dead. Tens of thousands of people have been killed. And why? Because you have two peoples who have been living in proximity to each other for centuries, who both fervently believe that their God has given them that land. And they're willing to kill each other for it. I don't know that I'm any better. I just don't happen to have that specific problem in my life or my personality, but that's what we have here. And you have, um, you, you know, you have these two peoples that are determined. They're not giving up. They're not going to quit. They haven't yet. Why would they? It's become a matter of pride. Macho pride. Religious pride. And so they're going to keep at it. The Apostle Paul understood this dynamic. Although the Palestinian people were, it was all different in his day, 2,000 some years ago, but his people were very similar to the way they are today. And so he wrote to the Jews, I became as a Jew in order to win Jews. Now, Paul was Jewish. He was a Pharisee. But it, he's, he, he perceived that in order to bring people to Jesus Christ who were Jewish, he had to act like a Jew, or else they wouldn't listen to him. But then he goes on and he talks about how I became all things to all people for the sake of the gospel. The people that he was writing to in this particular letter lived in the cosmopolitan city of Corinth, Greece. It was a church, a group of churches actually made up of Jews and Gentiles, for sure. Don't really know how many of each, but they were there. <laughs> Corinth was an important military and uh, commercial, commercial crossroads. Historians believe Corinth was probably the largest city in Greece at that time, maybe 100,000 residents or so, larger than Athens. 
Paul had walked into that town some years before, and he just showed up at the synagogue, which is what he did, and then he started preaching about Jesus as the Messiah, as the fulfillment of the Hebrew prophetic scriptures. And as it often happened in other places as well, he ended up not preaching in the synagogues because the Jews, many of them, could not hear what he had to say. They could not give up their belief, their identity. They didn't think that Jesus was really the Messiah, so he had to go. In some places, he was actually physically assaulted and forced away. Not in Corinth, but in other places. But he was made unwelcome just the same, and so he continued. He didn't give up. He never saw himself as having to give up his Jewish identity. He argued over and over again throughout the New Testament for the idea that in Christ there is no Jew nor Greek, but all belong to him. But of course, some people just couldn't go there. And they wouldn't go there. In the earliest days, it appears that most Christians still considered themselves Jews, even those who hadn't been born into the Jewish faith. There was an argument that was carried on. You can read about it in the book of Acts, the earliest Christian history book, an argument going on about whether you had to become a Jew in order to follow Jesus. And some said yes. So some people did. Other people did not. Some of these greatest debates of all were happening along that very line. Now, that's not a question that we ask ourselves anymore. But there are other things. There are other identities. There are other belief systems that can get in the way, that can drive a wedge between us and Jesus Christ. I want to thank Murray Pate for drawing my attention to an article recently from the National Review. It documents that the religious nuns have become more numerous in the USA than Roman Catholics and evangelicals. Now, nun here is not N-U-N, like the ladies that serve God over at St. Mary of the Woods. Nun is N-O-N-E. The nuns are the people who are either atheistic, they don't believe in any God at all, or they're agnostic. They're not sure what they believe. And they have become very prevalent in our culture, so much so that they outnumber not the evangelicals and the Catholics added together, but each one of those cohorts taken separately, the nuns are now more than that. And the younger the population, the more nuns there are. I mean, we all know it, right? The evidence is everywhere. Look around the room. We can all, Linda and I have been here five and a half years. And it's, there's been a change, hasn't there? And this is part of why. It's not the whole reason by a long shot. COVID had a lot to do with it, and there are other things that have come up. But part of it is that when I was a boy in the 1960s, everybody went to church, even though they didn't, but you sort of pretended that they all did. Nowadays, there are all kinds of things going on on Sunday morning. People take advantage of them, not the least of which is nothing at all. Just relaxing, staying at home. And if you're watching, I don't mean any sort of criticism of you or like I don't of the Jews. It's just a fact. It's how it is. Like the Apostle Paul, we have a commission, he called it, a job, an obligation that God has placed upon us, and it is to reach out to the nuns, to become what we need to become in order to, to connect with them, not as a trick, not as a, a sort of arrogant sort of presumption that we've got it better than they have it, but because God has called us to do this, to witness to people. And it's not easy, especially not for Presbyterians. 
I've given you this joke before. I apologize. It's too good not to repeat it right now. Do you want to see a Presbyterian raising his hands in worship? You want to see it again? It's not our style. And yet, we must decide what we intend to do about the calling we share with the Apostle Paul. How can we become better advocates for people outside the faith? They surround us. They live next door to us. Or maybe they believe, but they don't practice, or whatever it may be. But we have this job. How can we do it? Paul started with his fellow Jews and then expanded his witness to the Greeks and to others across a wide spectrum of religions and traditions in Corinth. We do not face the same demographics. We face the nuns, many of whom used to attend churches, many of whom have legitimate questions about our behavior as followers of Jesus Christ. Do we appear hypocritical sometimes? Many of whom ex have experienced pains that cause them <clears throat> to question the existence of God. Many of whom worry about how they will pay their bills even before they make a regular contribution to a church. How can we encourage them to make the same commitment we have tried to make in our own lives? To worship Jesus together and to serve his purposes in this world. Well, it turns out an awful lot of thought and research has been dropped into this question. And it turns out there's an answer. It's authenticity. It's walking your talk. It's being congruent between what you say and what you do. People are desperately searching for authenticity. There is so much inauthenticity in our world today, and this of course, is an election year. We don't trust anybody anymore. We've been taught that it's hard to do that because of what people will say or do to get what they want. If we act as followers of Jesus, people can see that, and it doesn't guarantee that they're all going to flock in here and join us, but it's the, it's the path. It's the way. Friends, walk your talk, and folks will, will come to Jesus. Maybe they won't come to us. Okay, that's fine. But they'll come to Jesus. Let us pray. Lord our God, we thank you that we know you and as imperfect as we may be and as inconstant in our practice of our faith, that we nevertheless have this, this calling and this desire to be here and to be a part of this. Work through us, we pray, by the power of your spirit, that we might become models, not perfect, but models, that people will find attractive enough to want to check you out. In the name of Christ we pray, amen.
see that? Our gifts are a, an expression of our gratitude for what God has already given us. And we give in order to, f to support the ministry, not just of this congregation, but of our denomination, the Presbyterian Church in the United States of America, and indeed missions across the world. Let the ushers please come and receive the offering. Let us pray. Oh, Lord, our God, we thank you for the opportunity to give back to you, and we ask that you would take these, our offerings, and use them effectively and powerfully in the workings of your will, near and far, now and forevermore, in the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Please be seated. Friends, this is the joyful feast of the people of God. They will come from east and west, from north and from south, and sit at table in the kingdom of God. According to Luke, when our risen Lord was at table with his disciples, he took the bread and blessed and broke it and gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened and they recognized him. This is the Lord's table. Our Savior invites those who trust him to share this feast which he has prepared. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God for our thanks and praise. Against you, you do not judge us. 
it still changes as we you said progress to call us back to your way. Then in the fullness of time of your great love for the world, you sent your only son to be one of us, to redeem us, and all our brothers. Therefore we praise you, join our voices, require danger, prophets, apostles, martyrs, who call the faithful every time and place, wherever singing the glory of your name. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and light. Heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. You are holy, O God of majesty, and blessed is Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. In Jesus, born of Mary, your word became flesh and dwelt among us, full of grace and truth. He healed the sick, fed the hungry, opened blind eyes, broke bread with outcasts and sinners, and proclaimed the good news of your kingdom to the poor and needy. Dying on the cross, he gave himself for the life of the world. Rising from the grave, he won for us victory over death. Seated at your right hand, he leads us to eternal life. We praise you that Christ now reigns with you in glory and will come again to make all things new. Remembering your gracious acts in Jesus Christ, we take from your creation this bread and this cup and joyfully celebrate his dying and rising as we await the day of his coming. With thanksgiving, we offer our very selves to you to be living and holy sacrifices dedicated to your service. Great is the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. This bread is Christ's body for us, sends out to be the body of Christ. In union with your church in heaven, eternal purpose in us and in all the world. Keep us faithful in your service until Christ comes and find victory. So we shall feast with all your sins and joy with the eternal life. Through Christ, with Christ, in Christ, and the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and all of yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Now with confidence until we God let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. On the night in which he was betrayed, our Savior sat at table with his disciples. And after sharing with them again the news of what was to befall him on the morrow, he took the bread and he blessed and he broke it, and he said, Take, eat, this is my body, broken for you on the cross. As often as you eat it, remember me. And in the same manner, after they had supped, he took the cup, and he poured it out. And he said, Take, drink, this is the cup of the new covenant made from my shed blood, as often as you drink it. Remember me.
Let us pray. God of glory, in this holy feast, you have made us one with Christ. And with that great multitude of the faithful, those who hunger and thirst no more, and worship night and day in your temple. Lead us in the paths of righteousness, and guide us to the springs of the water of life, until we join the choir of the redeemed, singing, Salvation belongs to our God, who is seated on the throne, and to the Lamb, Jesus Christ our Lord. And all God's people said, Amen.
Now may the love of God, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the communion fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all, now and forevermore. Amen.